And so NCLN, the National Campus Life Network, is a nonprofit pro-life organization dedicated to engage, persuade, and mobilize Canadian youth and young adults to end abortion in Canada. Great mission. They engage students through activism, they persuade students through their discussion groups, and they mobilize students through leadership training and life-affirming values so that they in turn can go and have an effect in their communities. NCLN supports and mentors pro-life clubs on Canadian universities, equipping them with the latest scientific data, apologetics, projects, and concrete ways for students to continue changing hearts and minds about abortion. I can think of few more worthy causes in our nation in 2019 than this one that NCLN is serving. Ruth Shaw is the director. Where is Ruth? She's, she's out there serving and talking to people. She is the executive director of the organization. Uh, you'll be hearing from Ruth at different points throughout this evening, so I'm just going to read her bio off right now so you know who's who when she steps up. She's wearing the beautiful uh, green blazer. There we go. Ruth, could you just wave so everybody can see you? Ruth Shaw is the executive director of the National Campus Life Network. She began pro-life work in 2007 as a member of the pro-life club at Carleton University, where the club was consistently discriminated against for its pro-life position. In 2010, Ruth and four other club members were arrested She's got some stories to tell <laughs> by Carleton administration for attempting to put up a pro-life display. In defense of the club, Ruth led a national media campaign and was interviewed by several major national media outlets over the course of several months. Subsequently, she filed a lawsuit against the school for their discrimination. Later that year, youth was Ruth excuse me, was named International Pro-Life Activist of the Year by Students for Life America, the largest pro-life youth organization in America, but she's ours. She's Canadian, and we're grateful. <laughs> we're so grateful for your leadership and your courage, Ruth. Ruth became the director of NCLN in 2017, and most recently was co-host of the largest pro-life march in Canada on EWTN, a major Catholic broadcasting network. So we will have the honor to hear from her uh, after Dr. Leventino speaks tonight. So without any further delay, I want to introduce to you uh, the man of the hour, our keynote speaker tonight, just picked up, scooped up from the airport, Dr. Anthony Levitino. He is a board certified obstetrician gynecologist with 40 years of medical experience. He is a physician and a lawyer and taught as an associate professor of OBGYN at Albany Medical Center, where he also served as the medical student director and residency program director. In the early part of his career, Dr. Levitino performed over 1,200 abortions in the first and second trimesters. He plays the doctor performing an ultrasound guided abortion in the movie Unplanned. Um, he is a YouTube celebrity. My husband is a massive fan and insisted that I got on an airplane tonight just to take a selfie with him. So you'll wanna watch that on my Instagram feed later on tonight. But I, I think it goes without saying that it is, it is a massive privilege and a massive honor to have him in our midst. He walked on the abortion industry in 1985. And since that has been a voice of moral clarity, of sanity, and of great courage in the face of great opposition. And so without further delay, we want to thank you so much, Dr. Levitino, for being with us tonight. Why don't we give him a good standing ovation from Canada. Thank you for being here. Come on up and take it away. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, first off, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, how does it, an abortionist end up in the pro-life movement? And I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal side of things. Uh, as I said, I am an attorney, uh, and I want to talk, a you know, and, and I did a totally different talk in, in colleges, and this is just a little piece of it. 
Uh, but it gives you some idea about the legalities and how complicated it gets, especially when you start talking about law. And then I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't say something about unplanned before we show the movie. All right, so why are you here? Why am I here? Why is this important? Come on, give me a break, Doc. This is just a choice. That's all it is. And of course it is. But how to, you know, I want you to understand why this is important to me, why it should be important to you. Some parts of the story are, I promise you, are not easy to listen to. I can tell you parts of the story are not easy to tell. But everything I'm telling you is firsthand and true. I want you to imagine for a minute that you're an obstetrician gynecologist like me. And I want you to imagine for a minute that you are a pro-choice obstetrician gynecologist like I used to be. Your patient today is 17 years old. She's 20 weeks pregnant. Her uterus is all the way up to her umbilicus. If you could see her baby, and that would be easy on an ultrasound scan, her baby would be the length of your hand, from the tip of your middle finger to your wrist, that's head to rump on a 20-week baby, not counting the legs. She's been feeling her baby kick for the last two weeks, but now she is asleep on an operating room table, and you're there to help her with her problem. You walk into that operating room scrubbed and gowned, and to the right, is a table with your instruments. And the first thing you're gonna reach for is a suction catheter. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's about 10 inches long, it's clear plastic, and there's a hole through the center. Picture yourself, if you can, putting this up through the cervix up into the uterus, and instruct the circulating nurse to turn on the suction machine. And what you'll see is pale yellow fluid running through the tubing into the machine. This is the amniotic fluid that was there to protect the baby, and now it's run into the machine. Now, if she were 12 weeks pregnant or less, I told you 20 weeks is the length of your hand. 12 weeks is the width of your hand for a hemp to rump, not counting the legs. If she were 12 weeks pregnant or less, you could pretty much do the entire abortion with this one instrument. Babies this big don't fit through catheters this size. So you put that down, and you reach for your sofa clamp. This one belongs to me. It's never been used in an abortion but it's the identical instrument I used for years. It's stainless steel, about 14 inches long, and the business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide. We have rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. A second trimester DNA abortion that I'm describing is a blind procedure. You can't see anything. Now in the movie, they talk about an ultrasound guided abortion and you can, do, you can use ultrasound in abortions. Many abortionists do, I didn't. So this was a blind procedure. And picture yourself taking this clamp, reaching up into the uterus, be careful, it's really easy to perforate the walls and grab anything you can blindly and pull hard, and I do mean hard and feel yourself pulling, and out comes a leg about this big, which you put down on the table next to you. Reaching again, grab blindly, pull hard, out comes an arm the same length, which you put down on the table next to you. And reach in with this instrument again and again, and tear out the spine, the intestines, the heart and lungs. A head on a baby that size is about the size of a plum, you can't see it, but you're pretty sure you got it. If you got something with the instrument and your fingers are spread as far as they'll go, you know you did it right if you crush down on the instrument and white material runs out of the cervix. That was the baby's brains. Now you can pull out skull pieces. Sometimes a little face comes back and stares back at you. Congratulations, you just successfully performed a second trimester Dini abortion. You just affirmed her right to choose. He just made $800 in 15 minutes. Now, I graduated from medical school in 1976, and if you asked me at the time how I felt about the abortion issue, I would not have hesitated for a second to tell you I was pro-choice. This was a decision between a woman, her doctor, and no one, including the baby's father, had anything to say about it. A lot of people identify themselves as pro-life or pro-choice, but for many people, it doesn't really affect their lives directly although it affects a lot more people than you know. But when you're an obstetrician gynecologist and you say you're pro-choice, now this isn't just some vague political position or it may not determine who you vote for in the next election. 
You have to decide whether you're going to actually do those abortions. And during my residency program in obstetrics and gynecology, I learned to do first and second trimester abortions. Now technology, and this is late 70s, 1977, and the technology at the time was not, some of it is no different than it is today, some of it was very different. But if they, if, and we had a clinic in our hospital, met twice a week, mostly younger patients came to that clinic. And if they were 12 to 13 weeks pregnant or less, we would book them for suction DNC abortions. Still the most common form of first trimester abortion. And believe it or not, we would do them in the delivery room. And when it was my turn to do them, I'd do three, four, five in the morning, never thought anything of it. If they were more than 12 or 13 weeks pregnant, we made, it, we made them at the time, we don't do this anymore, but we, at the time we made them wait until they were about 15 or 16 weeks pregnant and we would do saline abortions. Now these are not done anymore, but let's just suffice it to say that saline patients had to go through labor. It would take anywhere from eight to 36 hours for them to abort their usually dead children. But this was part of my training, and I was there to learn to be an obstetrician gynecologist. And I, like, you know, and I know people find it hard to believe. You know, if you're pro-choice, I do understand how you feel. If you're pro-life, I understand how you feel. I mean that sincerely on both sides. And I was there to learn to be an obstetrician gynecologist, and I learned to do abortions right along with hysterectomies, deliveries, and all the other things that obstetrician gynecologists do. Now in the first year of my training, um, I was uh, working at night, went down to the cafeteria one, one evening for a break, and met a young nurse that eventually I married a year later. Now, we started dating and made a huge mistake early on in our relationship. See, my wife was, pro -cho was very much pro-life. She, in New York, now in New York, now in Canada, you legalized abortion in 1969. Roe versus Wade in the States was in 73. New York State, where we were working, legalized in 1970, one year after Canada did. So we'd already been doing abortions for three years in New York State compared to the rest of the country. And she was in a nursing training program and was asked if she would assist at abortion. She had absolutely not. No way in heck would she have anything to do with it. But here we are dating and, of course, found out pretty quickly that we were on opposite sides of the issue. And that's when we made the first, most basic, and biggest mistake of our entire relationship. And that was, we decided not to talk about it. We ignored it. And that's a bad pattern to set up in a relationship. But we dated, we got married. Uh, you know, we've been married 42 years now. Back then, of course, we were in our late 20s and we, we thought we were so old. And uh, we were decided we wanted to have children right away, so we went about trying to start a family and found out pretty quickly that we had an infertility problem. My wife was just not getting pregnant. Um, any woman who's been through an infertility evaluation knows that it is difficult, it is painful, it is embarrassing, it is horrible. But she went through this and she would come home from those visits and lock herself in the bathroom and cry because there were two ironies that did not escape her. One, here she is married to an obstetrician gynecologist and she can't get pregnant. Two, here, she, here we are trying to make a baby and I'm killing them as part of my work. But as soon as that idea came in her head, she'd push it out just as fast. After a series of tests and other things, the physician who was taking care of her came to us and said, well, there's one more procedure I can try. It should take about an hour and a half. And when he walked out of the operating room four and a half hours later, he came up to me and he said, look, I never tell anyone that they're not going to be able to have a child, but don't count on it. Um, we were devastated. I mean, I came from a big Italian family. She came from a big Irish family. We wanted children. But we were pretty well told that just wasn't very likely and it wasn't going to happen. So what do you do? After we got over the shock, we decided we'd adopt a child. We were perfectly happy to, you know, take a child into our home and love as our own. And we started that process. And anybody in the room who's tried to adopt a child knows how difficult that is. We went to state agencies, we went to religious agencies, we went to county agencies, we went to anyone we could think of. And the best we could do after months of effort was to get on a five-year waiting list to get on the real waiting list. And it was during that time that I had my first doubts about abortions. They were strictly selfish. 
Here we are trying to adopt a child and I'm doing abortions on a, on a regular basis. And I'm not stupid. I understand that the reason there are so few children to adopt is because of people like me doing the abortions. And I remember extremely vividly one particular abortion. It was a suction DNC abortion in the delivery room. I was basically the patient, the anesthesiologist, and me. And I remember completing this abortion and thinking, gosh, I'm, I'm just throwing these kids in the garbage. Wouldn't even one of these women allow us to take her child home and care for her as our own? But of course, it doesn't work that way. After a lot of frustration on that front, I came up with what my wife still credits after all these years is the best idea I ever came up with a whole marriage besides asking her to marry me. Um, and that was, I said, you know, this is ridiculous. We are going through normal channels here. We are getting absolutely nowhere. I know 50 obstetricians on a first name basis. Let's just advertise. Let, let them all know that we're looking for a baby and maybe, maybe we'll get lucky and some kid will fall through the cracks and we'll be able to adopt them. So we did, that's exactly what we did. We let everybody know we were looking for a baby. In August of 1977, years, you know, several months after we started that, I was working in the operating room day with one of the attending physicians and a circulating nurse tapped me on the shoulder. And I turned around and she was holding up a piece of paper that said, call Marsha as soon as you're done. Now Marsha was the head of social services at, at our hospital. And that's all the note said, but I, and she's one of the people we'd talked to. That's all the note said, but I knew what it meant. And sure enough, she informed me that there was a 15-year-old girl in labor in the delivery room. She'd had no prenatal care. First time she saw a doctor was the day before. Now she's in labor. She's doing all right. Her parents took good care of her. The baby looks healthy. She wants to give her baby up for adoption. Are you interested? Oh yeah, man, am I interested? I remember staring at the face of the telephone to call my wife with this news and know that I was just seven digits away from becoming a father. And literally by the grace of God, we were able to adopt a little girl that we named Heather in August of 1978. Fantastic, we finally have a baby. And after all the years and after all the tears and after all the doubts, now we're parents. And my wife got pregnant the very next month. <laughs> and our son, Sean, was born in July 1979. Now, Sean and Heather were figuratively and literally close. They were 10 months apart. Anybody who'd look at them didn't know Heather was adopted. We go, 10 months apart? Man, you didn't give your wife much of a break, did you? <laughs> but hey, I've got a millionaire's family. I've got a son and a daughter, fantastic. And any doubts I had about doing abortions simply evaporated and I just went back to business as usual. I graduated from my residency program in 1980. We moved to the west coast of Florida. That lasted 10 months. We found out pretty quickly that a young couple with young kids didn't belong in a retirement community. And um, we left and moved back to upstate New York, outside of Albany, New York, and Troy, New York. And I joined practice with another physician that I had trained with. Now understand something, I was not running an abortion clinic. This was just a routine OBGYN office like pretty much every woman in this room has been to at one time or another. But Bill and I were both practiced abortionists and abortion was a part of our practice. In the early 80s, we were looking, we, meaning us in the abortion industry, were looking for a better method of for a second trimester abortion. You understand the first trimester is up to 13 weeks, second trimester is up to 27 weeks, third trimester 27 weeks till delivery. We were looking for a better method of second trimester abortions. As I told you earlier, we we're doing these things called saline procedures. They said they're not done anymore, but they're incredibly dangerous. They're um, difficult, they're extremely difficult for patients. Not only them, but patient difficult on staff and, and the staff as well because you've got these little babies being born after hours of labor. So what we were looking for was a, a method of second trimester abortion that was like suction DNC. The patient would go to sleep and when she woke up, it would all be over. And that's when d and &E abortions were developed, the one I described earlier. And very few physicians were willing to touch that procedure, it's tricky. Uh, and as we, just, we saw an opportunity, so we trained ourselves to do these second trimester DNA abortions. 
And as a result, we were getting, as I said, we weren't running an abortion clinic, but we were getting referrals from other physicians to do these procedures on their patients. Over the next four years, I did 1,200 abortions. Over 100 of them were the second trimester DNEs that I described. But hey, life's good. Kids are growing, finally making some money. We can afford furniture. Everything was just wonderful until June 23rd, 1984. June 23rd was a beautiful day in Albany, and uh, Heather was exactly two months away from her sixth birthday. Sean was just a few days away from his fifth birthday. Heather had graduated from kindergarten two weeks before, and uh, I was on call, but it wasn't very busy, so you know we, raved, we took the kids out to an amusement park that afternoon. Um, had dinner together, and then we had friends coming over for cake and coffee, so, you know, the kids were playing in the backyard when our friends arrived. And we were talking with our friends, and at 7.25 that night, we heard the screech of brakes out in front of the house. Kids had gone in the road. Heather had been hit by a car. She was a mess. I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to be able to save people's lives. My wife was an intensive care nurse. This was routine for us. We did everything we could, and it made absolutely no difference. And she literally died in our arms in the back of an ambulance that night. If you have children, you may think that you have some idea of what that's like. If you haven't been through this yourself, you have absolutely no idea. I hope you never find out. But what do you do after a disaster? You bury your child, you take some time off, and then you try to get back into your life. And I don't know how long it was after Heather's death, a few weeks, I'm sure, but I showed up at OR number nine at Albany Medical Center just like I had over 100 times before for a second trimester d &E abortion. I wasn't thinking of this as anything special. This was routine, and I obviously had other things on my mind. And I started that abortion, and I reached in with a sofa clamp, and I tore out an arm or a leg, and I just stared at it in the clamp, and I got sick. You know, I described stacking up body parts on the side of the table earlier. That's not to gross out the nice people that came to the lecture. When you do an abortion, you have to keep inventory. You have to make sure that you get two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Because if you don't, your patient's going to come back infected, bleeding, or dead. So I finished that abortion. And I know it sounds strange to people, and I promised you earlier that everything I'm telling you is firsthand and true. I finished that abortion, and for the first time in my career, after all those years and all those abortions, I looked. I mean, I really, really looked at that pile of goo on the side of the table. And I didn't see her wonderful right to choose and I didn't see what a great doctor I was helping her with her problem. And I didn't even see the $800 cash I just made in 15 minutes. All I could see was somebody's son or daughter. And suddenly this looked very different to me. It has occurred to me in that moment that this patient had come to me, figuratively, never literally, and said, here's $800, kill my son or daughter. And I was the kind of person that would look her right back in the eye with no compunction whatsoever, say, sure, I'll do that. Now, obviously, we were in a crisis. I told you earlier that Seal and I made a big mistake early on not talking about the abortion issue. The problem is when you start getting into a pattern of not talking about one important issue, sometimes you start getting into a pattern of ignoring other important issues. And we've been growing apart. And Heather's death was the straw that almost broke the camel's back. I was feeling bad. I was feeling guilty. But I don't think I just stopped. I kept doing them. But it was tough. And I got into this, and I was an absolute bear to be around. My wife always knew when I had abortions scheduled the next day because I'd gotten into a blame game. 
It was the girl's fault for getting pregnant. It's the hospital's fault for allowing him. It was the nurse's fault for scheduling him. And aren't we all the same way? It's everybody else's fault but mine. And after a month or two of this, and with everything else that was going on, she'd had it up to there. And I told you, I'm full-blooded Sicilian, she's full-blooded Irish. Trust me, we could have very lively discussions at times. She had, I did not know, but she had a bag packed, and she was two minutes away from walking out. But she was going to have her say. And she let me have it with both barrels. It's not the girl's fault. It's not the hospital's fault. It's not the nurse's fault. You stupid idiot. If you're feeling so bad, why don't you just quit? We talked for an hour and a half. First time we talked about it. And I'm happy to say she didn't leave. But the next day I went to my partners and I told them I would no longer do any more of the second trimester DE abortions. It was just too painful. They knew what was going on and they were very understanding at first. I said, no, but I was hard headed. I'll just do the little ones. I'm just going to do the suction DNCs we do in the office. And for a few more months, I soldiered on doing those. I know you look up to physicians. You think of us as something special. We're no different than you are. And I know it sounds almost stupid to say it out loud. But once you figure out here, not here, that killing a baby this big for money is wrong, and it doesn't take you too long to figure out that it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or even this big, it's all the same. And it was February of 1985, that long after her death, that I finally went back to my partners the second time and told them I would no longer do any more abortions. I haven't done one since, and obviously I will never ever do another one. You're being very kind, but what did I just say? Why did I quit? I quit because I hurt, period. That was it. That was all of it. That's as noble as it got. Stop doing abortions. When I look back, it kind of makes sense. Get involved in the pro-life movement? Not a chance. Everyone in the abortion industry knows that everybody in the pro-life movement is a kook. We know this because CNN tells me so, and they would never lie to me. <laughs> God had his own plans. Uh, months after um, I'd stopped doing abortions, uh, my wife told me that we had been invited to go to a pro-life potluck dinner, and I laughed. And I said, why would I want to go to some rubber chicken dinner with a bunch of pro-life kooks? I said that. It was on a Friday night, like tonight, we had another commitment, so I had an easy out. But as it coincidentally happened, and I understand coincidence is better now, the pro-life potluck dinner was on the road that we, where we, to where we were going. We had to pass it to go where we were going. And we were driving, and I looked at her, and I said, you know what, just for giggles, let's stop at the pro-life potluck dinner. We'll, we'll stay for 10 minutes. And I walked in, and it's really stupid just thinking about it. I mean, it's a hall about this size, maybe 40, 50 people there, and... I walk in and the place went dead quiet. I had no idea these people knew who I was, but they did. And a lot of them didn't know I was, I had quit doing abortions. I didn't take it on an ad, I just stopped. We ended up spending an hour and a half at the pro-life potluck dinner. Guess what? They weren't kooks. They understood the medicine, they understood the law. They were giving of their time and their resources voluntarily and sacrificially to stop what, what they saw as the worst human rights abuse of our time. And we were impressed, so we joined Citizens Concerned for Human Life, this group in Albany. It was sometime later that I started speaking on a limited basis. So, you know, it's funny, I didn't know a lot about, I am an attorney as well. Um, I didn't understand a lot about Canadian abortion law, so I looked it up yesterday and found out, you don't have a law. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's weird. <laughs> you know, I found out in 1969 they passed an abortion law here, but it was pretty restricted. Only for serious health conditions, only with the approval of three physicians. Um, that didn't stop 
some individuals from just getting into the abortion industry. And, and then I understand in the 1980s, your Supreme Court struck the law down, and that's where it sits today. There is no law, pretty much any time, anywhere, any reason. It's a little more complicated in the states. Now, obviously, you have our provinces, we have our states. I think I'm not, I'm no, obviously no expert on Canadian politics. But I understand, my understanding is our states have a bit more autonomy than your provinces in this regard. And you, you see what's happening across the way. You know, you've got all these states with different laws. And it's been interesting, the evolution of laws in, in the United States. I mean, when Clinton was president down there, it was we were going to make abortions safe, legal, and rare. No one's talking about that anymore. They aren't even talking about pro-choice. I understand there's been at least one ruling by a court here that your physicians must refer for abortions. They haven't, they haven't, they've stopped short of they have to perform abortions. Trust me, just give them time, okay? Um, it's a bit different there. So I want to explain a little bit, because this confuses the heck out of people, and it's funny because I was talking about this with somebody outside before we got started. I want you to understand a little bit about jurisprudence. Now, lawyers, that is, I'm sorry, how many lawyers in the room? Few, okay, so we're a different breed, right? They do not understand us. They just don't. People don't understand that in law, every word means something. So I seriously, I need a volunteer in the audience. I promise I won't embarrass you. I'm just gonna ask some simple questions. One of the students, what's your name? Sandra. Cassandra. 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 Can we get Cassandra a microphone? Until we get your, here she comes. Actually, bring up, my, bring up that, that, that sure, PowerPoint sure. presentation. Let's see what we've got up here. Now we're, this, is, this is piece of a much bigger presentation than that, um, that, we, that I do for colleges. Okay? Check, check. There she goes. Ah, Cassandra. Great. You have everybody. Okay. Stand up, Cassandra. Okay, so let's see. Bring up the, hit the next one. Okay, what is the legal basis or justification for elective abortion? I mean, in this country, you don't have a law, but in the United States, we do. Okay, so how do they justify it legally? All right, next one. How late, and now another one, in the United States, or for that matter, in Canada, how late can an elective be abortion be performed? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah, right through. In years past, if you ask people that, they would say 12 weeks or 16 weeks or maybe 24 weeks have been creeping up as time gone by. But the answer is really all the way. But that isn't exactly quite what the law says. So, next one. Okay. And this is what you have to understand about us darn lawyers, okay? Every word means something. You must not ignore that. And it gets to the point of almost absurdity for anybody who's not involved in the law. Next one. Okay. So, Cassandra, are you a human being? Yes. How do I know? Because I am living and breathing. You're living and breathing. Do you have, I have four cats. Uh, I have Every a one of them today. is living and breathing. <laughs> <laughs> I have human DNA. You have, I'll take that, okay. I'll take that. So you have human DNA. You've got 46 human chromosomes, okay? And you're an animal that looks kind of like this, okay? In other words, Cassandra, would you agree with me? You are a human being. How is it, what is it that makes you human? I mean, your DNA and all that other stuff, but you're a human being, would you agree, by definition, by scientific definition? Science tells me that Cassandra's a human being. Anybody argue with that? No. Okay, now the better one. Cassandra, are you a person? Yes. How do I know? Because or, <laughs> what is the difference, if any, between a human being and a person? Is there any difference between them? I think a person is just, you, you have a unique identity? No. <laughs> and that's okay. Most people do not understand this. Anybody want to help Cassandra out? Is there, show of hands, does anyone here think there's a difference? Raise his hands if you think there's no difference between a human and a person. You're all wrong. 
You are dead wrong. Yeah, weird, isn't it? So let's, tr let's help Cassandra out. What is the difference? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to answer my own question. There is a difference. What is the difference between a human and a person? One what? Recognize, oh, ooh, ooh, there's that dirty word. <laughs> Law. Really? So, in other words, Cassandra is a human being by scientific definition. But you're telling me she's a person by law. What does it take to be a person by law, Cassandra? What do you have that lets me know that you're a person? Tuffy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's really important. Go ahead. What is she? Yeah, there's the magic word. Thank you, Cassandra. <laughs> she has rights. Persons have rights. It's a little hard to believe. And in law, in the universe of law, only two things exist. Only two. In the, whole, in the whole universe, there are only two things as far as law is concerned. Persons and property. Okay? This is my property. I can use it. I could gift it. I could sell it. I could break it. No one would be shocked. It's my property. I can do with it as I wish. Persons have rights. Actually, you're not off the hook yet, Cassandra. <laughs> <laughs> you're a human being, and you are a person. When did you become a human being? At the moment of my conception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we, we could even argue that a little bit. I could even give you some other, we're not going to bother, but I could even give you some other definitions. But sometime, way, 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 way back, you became a human being, right? When did you become a person? At the moment of my conception. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Has there ever been a time in history, and we'll include the United States in this because we have to, when human beings were not persons but property? Yes. Ooh, yeah. Okay? They were property. All right? Under the law, they had no rights. Okay? We talk about our rights coming from God, but they really come from government. And your rights can be taken away with a stroke of a pen. And if you don't think so, now you can sit down. You could be a Jew born in, you could be a Jew in Germany in the 1930s, and you would find out really fast that your rights could be taken away with a signature, nothing else. And this is what we're talking about. Okay, let's go from here. Okay, these are U.S. Supreme Court decisions. Everybody, go ahead and click one more. Everybody's heard of Roe versus Wade. I bet even you've heard of Roe versus Wade, okay? If you ask the average American to name one Supreme Court decision, 99.9% .9 of them will come up with Roe versus Wade. A couple might come up with Brown v. Board of Education, but that's pretty much it, okay? But what did it say? Okay, well, I told you earlier, it's a trimester's in pregnancy. First trimester up to 13 weeks, second trimester up to 27 weeks, third trimester 27 weeks till term, okay? So what did Roe actually say? Well, it said that in the first, click the next one, I'm not even sure what the next line, okay, we'll click back. Okay, good. It said that in the first trimester, no one, and of course the Supreme Court now overrules all state laws, okay, so that all those laws, there's still anti-abortion laws on the books, they just can't take effect because of Roe. In the first trimester, you cannot refuse a woman an abortion, period, exclamation point, done. In the second trimester, you could regulate, if the state wished, they could regulate how uh, certain medical aspects of abortion. For instance, you might say only doctors could do abortions, or they'd have to be second trimester abortions, or they have to be done in hospitals. You can't refuse them, but you can at least regulate them to some degree. And in the third trimester, if, if a state wishes, careful, and we got 50 of them, and they're all doing something different, if the state wishes, they could prohibit abortion because at that point the baby's viable, okay? Except it's a small problem 
This was 1973. Viability back then was around 27 weeks, the third trimester. But medical science has not stood still for the last 40 some 46 years. It's moved forward. Viability now is down at 22 weeks. Even WHO recognizes that. So we've got a bit of a problem there. Okay. Now, ah, but I, I misstated something deliberately. A state could prohibit abortions in the third trimester unless it was a matter of the woman's health. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, I'm trying to get the non-lawyers in the room to think like lawyers. And when you hear that, what do you want to know? What should you be asking next? Go ahead. What is the definition of health? Uh-oh. Every word means something. Okay? Next slide. Everybody's heard of Roe versus Wade. Nobody's heard of, heard of Doe versus Bolton. Another abortion case ruled the same day as Roe, and thankfully, it defined the term health. Good, now we know what it is. Go ahead. Health includes, next, her physical health. That's great. Uh, how bad does her health have to be? What if she's got cancer? What if she's going to die? What if she's got a headache? Doesn't say. Next, includes her mental health. Uh, how bad does her mental health have to be? What if she's going to have a psychotic break? What if she's depressed? Next, her economic health. I like that one. How poor do you have to be to be economically unhealthy? Doesn't say. And my favorite, social health. Can somebody tell me what that means? I tell people, I can give you one example of what I think was a social health situation. This is a true story. 17-year-old girl walks into my office requesting her fifth abortion, and I gave it to her, okay? And we were, and uh, we didn't always, you know, I won't, I won't get into detail, but we were extremely careful talking and counseling our patients. We did not want to ever be in a position, we did an ultrasound in every single one of our patients. We did not want to be caught thinking it was a different gestational age. And the other thing was, we were very careful counseling them. I never wanted to be in a position where I was doing an abortion where somebody was being coerced, okay? So I knew why every single one of my patients had their abortions, okay? In her case, she wanted her fifth abortion because, and she was very firm about this, her reason was she did not want to be pregnant for her senior prom. That's her social health. So when you take all this into account, what does Roe really mean? Any abortion, any time, for any reason. And I won't go through them. They're in the slides. We're going to skip them here. But that's basically what the law in the United States, New York passed a law, a new abortion law. Abortions are okay up to 24 weeks unless her health is involved. <laughs> what did they just say? When, in a, when a politician, they play these games all the time. It drives me mad. I'd be happy to sign your pro-life legislation as long as there's a health exception in it. What, what did that politician just say? I'd be happy to support your legislation as long as there's an exception. It's so big, you could drive an escalate through it. Okay? And that's what the games that are played. How bad can it get? Play uh, the New Mexico video, please. This was shot inside an abortion clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico. No, and there's nothing graphic here, I promise. And there's a quiz at the end, <laughs> if we can get it running. <laughs> and a one, and a... No? There you go. Audio? Sorry, guys. There we go. Octavoid, Southwestern Women's Options. How may I help you? 
Hi, um, I was hoping to uh, schedule an abortion. All right. What was the day of your last period? Um, it was like the middle of May, so like May 15th, probably. All right, so it looks like uh, we can do this for you, but it is going to be a week-long procedure. So if you're able to come next week and we start this on the 12th, um, I'm going to be looking at a fee of $8,000. Oh. Now, uh-huh, are you still in your chair? Oh, just barely. <laughs> just barely. But what you also need to keep in mind is that every week that goes by, the fee goes up by another $1,000. What we get is that you're 27 weeks. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yep. So you're about a month, yeah, actually, you're about a month off in how you thought. Oh, wow. To insert the injection, it's going straight into the, um, into the sac and to the pregnancy, okay? It's bottom down. It'll insert through the, the baby's bottom. Okay. okay, if so it's the head down, it'll be inserted through the head, through the cranium. If we can't catch it early enough, which I, um, it, it has happened, if you're feeling pressure, it's moving down or something coming out, um, the pregnancy coming out, um, then you'll want to unlock the door <laughs> to the hotel room, get your cell phone and just sit on the toilet. You don't have to look at anything, you don't have to clean anything up or nothing, just be on the phone with us. And um, we'll kind of, and you could stay on the phone with us until the doctor and nurse get there. Okay? Oh, good. So just go in the toilet if I'm having leave. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what if it what if it does come out when I'm on the toilet? Just you don't gotta look down. You don't gotta do anything. The doctor and nurse will come take care of it. Um, if you feel like it's too much to see any of it, then do not let yourself look at it. Okay. okay. Um, just okay. if you want to cover yourself even with like a towel or something. Okay. Go ahead. If you're one of those lucky people that has no pain with contractions and all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, something's coming out, you sit on the toilet <laughs> okay, and you call us and you unlock the hotel room and we come in and we take care of you. If I'm on the toilet yeah. and it pops out and it's in the toilet, yeah. what, what do I do? You would just sit there and you would stay there. Okay. And you would not move until we come and get you. Okay. I mean, I don't have to worry about like you don't have to taking it out or anything. You don't have to clean anything. You don't have to do anything. Okay. You yeah. will, you will do. Okay. You take care of everything. <laughs> okay. So how much does this abortion cost? Uh-uh, that's 25 weeks, she's 27. 10,000 American, which my phone tells me is over 13,000 Canadian. And for 13,000 Canadian dollars, these guys can't afford to have a doctor or a nurse sit with this patient while she labors alone in a hotel room. Now, I've been in some pretty nice hotels. I've been in some pretty not-so-nice hotels, okay? Could anything happen to her 27 weeks, third trimester of pregnancy? Could anything happen to her while she's in labor? Like what? Her blood pressure could get out of control. She could hemorrhage. She could get infected. And yet, for that kind of money, $10,000 American, they cannot afford to sit with her and be with her and monitor her properly while she delivers her dead son or daughter into a toilet. This is what it has become. That's why I'm here. Maybe that's why you're here. I could talk all night. I gotta leave you some time for questions. Cassandra might want to get back at me. <laughs> so we'll open it up for questions. Or I've stunned you into silence, one or the other. I've had that happen. So, Nobody? sorry. Oh, one sorry. brave person. Oh, He'll bring the microphone up. Sorry, everyone. The way that we're going to do question period is if everyone who would like to ask a question could just make a line up through the middle, um, and um, that way we can monitor and facilitate questions in an orderly fashion. So we'll just give a minute for anyone who would like to ask a question to please line up now. Oh, yeah, of course. We'll bring the mic to anyone. You're who's first. Unable. You're the one. You were the only one brave enough to stick your hand up.
Um, so in doing pro-life dialogue on campus, um, sorry, can you hear me? I, I'm old and my hearing's <laughs> terrible. No, just on, speak right? right into it. You'll be fine. Okay. Um, so in doing pro-life dialogue on campus, one of, like, the most common thing that people say is that they're for abortion because what if it's it's dangerous for the woman's health, like she's going to die or something. How, okay. Yeah, how often... Like, that's fair. How rare is that? How not rare is that? That it, it would that, actually that's be That's a great question. Yeah. That's a great question. It's very important, too. Can, can pregnancy be dangerous? You bet. Can pregnancy kill a woman? You bet. Doesn't happen as often as it used to, but it still happens. Okay? So that's fine. Let's say, now, there are, there are situations, and this may surprise people, there are situations where even a pro-life physician would not even hesitate for a tenth of a second to terminate a pregnancy, me included. Let's say she has an ectopic pregnancy. Anybody know this is a tubal pregnancy? You, I, she's, she's got pain on one side. She comes in. She's having a little bit of bleeding. I do an ultrasound, and there, sitting in the left tube, is a very nice little fetus with a heartbeat. What am I going to do as a pro-life physician? I'm going to take that pregnancy out because it's going to kill her. Period. No discussion. And no moral qualm about it either. She is going to die. I can cite, what if, she, a hypothetical, I never saw it in all the years. I spent 10 years doing high-risk obstetrics, and I never saw it. But let's just, hypothetically, somebody's 12 weeks pregnant and she develops cervical cancer. What am I going to do? I'm going to treat her cancer because she's going to die. What's going to happen to the baby? Baby's going to die. There's no way around it. So those situations, when, when it's like that, there's no question. But here's where it gets tricky. I've seen them all. I spent 10 years doing high-risk obstetrics. I was in a center that got these patients on referral. Toxemia. Okay, a pregnancy. I'll give you an example, a, a specific example of that. Um, out-of-control diabetes, decompensating heart things, cancers, all the stuff that were threatening them. When serious problems of that nature come up in pregnancy, they almost always come up in the, last, in the, in the latter half of pregnancy. And kids are viable at 22 weeks. We talked about that, okay? So, real live case. Patient comes in, 27 weeks. She, uh, her, nor, everybody knows of normal blood pressure, right? 120 over 80-ish. Okay, you all know the number. This lady's blood pressure when she came in was 220 over 160. Yeah, she's got severe preeclampsia, severe toxemia. She could potentially be minutes or hours away from a stroke. You've got to end, the word is terminate, but I can't even use the word because they've stolen it. I have to terminate this pregnancy. I have to end this pregnancy. This pregnancy is going to kill her. It is killing her, literally killing her. Okay, so what did I do? Stabilized the patient, did a cesarean section. 30 minutes later, mom and baby do fine. Wonderful. But wait a minute, but what if she had decided, and she could, what if she were 27 weeks in that situation? Because you hear all the time, and this is what you're referring to. We need abortion to save women's lives, right? Okay, what if she had said, you know what? I've thought about this really long and hard. There's just a lot of reasons why I can't be a mom right now. I would rather have an abortion. Would abortion be an option to take care of her? Why are you shaking your head? It would end the pregnancy. But there are other options to save her. Uh, no, 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 no. I want the abortion. Yes, there are other options, but she wants the abortion. She wants it. Would it be reasonable or could I do that? No. <laughs> why not? Because I told you there was a quiz. <laughs> the lady in the video was also 27 weeks. What did you hear at the beginning of the video? Are you asking, like, legally, couldn't you do that? Or are you asking my... Perfectly own? legal. Oh, yeah, of course it's legal. It's but, legal like... here. It's legal in the States. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a one-week procedure. Uh. <laughs> if a patient comes in with a blood pressure of 220 uh, over 160, and I fool around for a week, she's going to die. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. Abortion, despite this, I'm sorry, the medical term is BS, <laughs> that says that a, we need abortion to save women's lives is horse hockey. Okay. It takes too long mm. in the vast, vast majority. There are some situations like the ectopic where that is true. And there isn't a physician in this whole continent 
pro-life physician that wouldn't treat that woman in a heartbeat because she needs her life saved. But the reality is, it doesn't happen very often. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Next up. So amazing question. Oh, you shut me down? Brilliant answer. Yeah, I'm stepping in. Sorry. Women <laughs> do that. We have a tend to interrupt, you know, it's girl okay, types. That's all right. um, just kidding. Uh, so just want to give a couple guidelines, first of all. We want to make sure that we get through as many questions as possible. So when you step up to the microphone, if you could try to keep any introductory comments as concise as possible, 30 seconds or less, and then boom, ask your question. And we're just going to go to this guy next and then to this lovely woman here at the microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm in the night of Columbus, um, and I have a CP1. My when I was in my mother's room, and the doctors saw them where there was a problem with me, yeah. and they wanted to abort. But my, thank God, my mother didn't didn't accept. Didn't said no. I will live with the consequences. My question is. You were talking about a separate um, views. What, for somebody like me that is married now, my wife is more for choice than for life. So what is your, what, if you have any idea to help any time I talk to her, like you and your wife, it's a argument of, so I, I don't want to. She almost left me also like you, so just if you have any idea. It's a good question, but I think what you're asking is what happens when there's a problem in a pregnancy and the wife feels one way and the husband feels another, right? Only matters what she thinks. He has no say. Legally, he has no say. Now, you want to destroy a marriage. That's one quick, easy way to do it. Okay, but legally, he has no say. None whatsoever. And that's tough. Obviously, I would be trying to get husband and wife to at least agree on a course of action. But in the end, if she wants the abortion... She's going to get the abortion, no matter what he thinks. Good question. So do you have to be an OBGYN to perform abortions? Heck no. <laughs> no, and that's, and that's been a lot. I, I don't know about RU486 in Canada. Um, there, are definite, there are some restrictions on its use in the United States. You can't get it at the drugstore, for instance. Although now they're trying to change that. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Hey, I got this pill you can take. Um, it's, it's more difficult. Uh, but RU46 was fast-tracked by the FDA to get it on the market. And part of the reason was, part of the difficulty the abortion industry has now, it's been having it for a while, is more and more physicians are not doing abortions. My story is my story. Most doctors are not that way. But a lot of people used to do abortions, frankly, got a belly full of killing, and they stopped. And it's getting harder and harder to find abor you know, OBGYN abortionists. Ah, but if we could have this drug, you don't have to be a surgeon. All you have to do is write a prescription. Isn't that handy? And nurse practitioners and pediatricians and general anybody can just do an abortion that way. And that's one of the reasons why it's been promoted as much as it has. In my view, that's one of the reasons it's been promoted as much as it has, so that other people could do abortions as well. Forget the fact that they're not equipped to take care of the complications. Who cares? Uh, but that's the reality of it. Uh, in fact, I apologize. If I, 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 it was in the lecture, but I didn't have time. If I read to you the New York law... I don't know if we can bring it up quickly or not. It's one of the next slides of that lecture. The first line of the New York law. Remember, every word is important in law. Got to remember that. 
very first word of the New York, the New York abortion law, a medical practitioner, does not say doctor, a medical practitioner may do an abortion up to 24 weeks unless her health is involved. All right, there's a reason it says that. A healthcare practitioner may perform an abortion when according to the practitioner's reasonable and good faith professional judgment, no oversight, not by a doctor, not by the state, not by the hospital, not by nobody, okay? can then do an abortion up to, can you imagine some nurse practitioner? Sorry for all the nurse practitioner room, but 24 weeks, <laughs> go for it. You have anyone to find out how difficult that is? But according to law, it's perfectly legal. Next question. How successful, how successful have you been in con, uh, convincing your colleagues to change their minds about abortion? <laughs> That's not easy. Um, you will, you, how do you get people to change their mind on abortion? You will never, and, and, for, and people who, I don't know, anybody in the room ever picket an abortionist? Anybody in here? Not too many? Good. It happens. Um, you will never change, a, a per, a, say, a doctor's mind about being, doing abortions by going to his office, putting up a sign, and yelling murderer over a microphone. Ain't going to happen. Okay? Sorry. If you want to change anybody's mind about anything, and this is just a general rule in life, you've got to develop a relationship with that person. So I, I've, I've got stories, but I, I, don't, I don't want to take too much time, but you'd have to develop a relationship. Patient-physician relationship is a relationship, okay? Patients can heavily influence their doctors, um, but you've got to develop a relationship with them. Talk with them, meet with them, have lunch with them. If you can develop a relationship, maybe over time, you can make a difference. But don't expect it's going to be any time fast. It could be years. But it can be done. Hi, my name's Flavia Berrio. Um, I, I, I missed the, the beginning. Did you give an introduction as to what you do nowadays other than just give great talks like this one? <laughs> <laughs> I teach in a medical school, um, and I do uh, a very limited hormone practice. So all the menopausal women in the room, if you want to bear hormones, no. <laughs> Actually, not just women, it's men too, but that's beside the point. That's all I do at this point, professionally. I do teach, though. Um, hi, my question, uh, I feel like we get a lot of different narratives about money in abortion practice. There's the, um, you know, unplanned, one of the major points is how her clinic is uh, staying financially solvent, mainly because of abortion. There's the selling of fetal parts. But then there's also the um, narrative about how um, you know, Planned Parenthood needs this funding or they'll go under. Then there's Cecile Richards, of course, making multiple millions of dollars. Uh, and your example, of course, of the, uh, the procedure that costs multiple thousands of dollars, but they can't afford to do more than um, stick her in a hotel room. Um, as somebody in part of the system who has been in that system, do you have any insight? Like, are there people getting rich off of this? Or what is the, um, what is the justification given, for instance, for that procedure and not being able to afford proper care during it? That's a great question. It's kind of multi-layered, yeah. okay? <laughs> First, um, I never work for free. I'll bet money you don't work for free. Nobody works for free. Maybe the nuns work for free. I don't know, but <laughs> I ain't going there. Uh, oh, I gotta get hit by lightning. Um, <laughs> nobody works for free, okay? So, yeah. And there are people who volunteer in their ways, but the point is you're doing it to make a living. And let's keep it simple. I talked about $800 on a D&E abortion. They had, a, they had the same abortion now. We're talking late 80s, probably more like $1,500, um, which actually, if you look at it, didn't even keep up with inflation, but that's beside the point. Um, you can make a lot of money doing abortions. It's, you can be fast. You can work in a clinic and you can, you run two or three rooms. You can do an abortion every 15 minutes, literally, and go from room to room to room to room. Take two, three, four, five hundred dollars, depending on how far along the, the pregnancy is. Um, and I don't fault, I'm a capitalist, I don't fault people for making a living, okay? I may argue how they make a living, but the point is they're making a living. Um, certainly, if I'm doing procedures that I'm, you know, Let's look at the, the abortions we talk about, okay? It even takes a week, wow, a whole week. You know, as an obstetrician gynecologist, I can just take care of pregnant women and deliver them. I take care of them for nine months. They call me at 11 o'clock at night. 
I'm up all night long waiting for this baby to deliver. Finally, the baby delivers, and I make maybe $1,500, okay? And I face, at least in the States, face massive medical liability if there's anything wrong with that kid. Sufficient liability that it could literally wipe me out financially. Any one delivery could wipe me out financially in the United States. As opposed to that, I could do abortions. I could do like three suction DNC abortions in 45 minutes, make more money than that dumb sucker who was up in the middle of the night doing the delivery, and I could be on the golf course at one o'clock. Who's the fool? Yeah, there is a financial aspect to it. You mentioned Planned Parenthood, uh, don't even get me started. You know, about a third of their money comes from taxes, US taxes, a third from the procedures they do, and a third from donations. This, I mean, you know, they're going to cry poor, but believe me, it's, they're an abortion corporation. It's what they do. Okay. And that's what Unplanned is about. Have you seen Unplanned? Yeah. Okay, you know. Oh, and then, let me quick, a quick word about Unplanned. I'm remiss if I don't. Real fast. Um, I've heard so much stuff. I mean, you, and you guys in Canada, pro-life people in Canada, my hat's off. I'm the one who should be giving you the standing ovation, <laughs> every one of you because you're living in the People's Republic up here, and they'll probably throw me out of the country for saying that, okay? <laughs> you really do. Um, Pro-lifers have it a heck of a lot easier in the States than you do here, okay? I mean, look at the, the controversy about the stupid movie. You know, they won't show it in the theaters, and they're having protests, and what are they afraid of? But let me tell you something, and then you hear the rest of this, oh, it's, it's really, it's, it's propaganda, it's totally inaccurate. Let me tell you something, it's very accurate. <laughs> that scene that I'm in, it's about two whole minutes. Took, I'll tell you about that in a minute. It's like two whole minutes on screen, my two minutes of fame. Um, let me tell you something. It's accurate. We work to make it accurate. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting because the, the other thing, and you've seen the movie, some people here haven't, but Abby talks about her experience when she had a, a, a medical abortion, okay? Oh, it's, it's inaccurate. It's propaganda. Excuse me? In the, in, the, in the age of me too and women have to be believed, you are questioning this woman's first-hand story <laughs> about what happened to her? Excuse me? Am I hearing you right? Bull, okay? It's very accurate. Um, as far as the movie was concerned, I, Chuck Hanselman and Carrie Solomon were the writer-directors of Unplanned. I... I got a phone call of a clear blue sky in the middle of the day. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was Chuck. You know, introduces himself. Hi, I'm the writer-director of God's Not Dead. We're doing this movie. We want you to play the abortionist. And I'm like, uh, you realize I have absolutely no acting experience. <laughs> and he said, we don't care. We've seen your stuff. We want you to do the part. It's like, okay. Um, I show up. It's kind of cool. I mean, you know, you've, you've got the trailer with your name on it. Yeah, it's on a piece of paper they tore down the next day, but it was there. <laughs> and, you know, they put you through the makeup and the, and, the, and the costumes and the whole thing, and then you hit the set, and you'll see in the movie, it's about two minutes long. We took, we were six and a half hours on set shooting that scene, okay, because they do it over and over and over again, and you change the lines, and they change the camera angles, and it was cool. My wife was with me. Oh, and it was interesting. This was a very Christian production. Now, I have never been on a movie set before. It's the first and probably only movie I'll ever do, okay? Here's, I'm on, a, I'm on a real movie set, man. There are people all over the place. There's all the food you could possibly eat. There's all this stuff. And they've got like a husband and wife minister team praying constantly during the shooting of the movie. I'm sure that's standard Hollywood fare. <laughs> And it's, it's a long time. I, I was three hours before I got my first break. And my wife was with me, and I hadn't seen her in all the time. I thought, oh, she's probably bored to death. Oh, Chuck and Carrie, they had her in the director's chair with headphones on, watching the whole thing. At one point, they had, uh, in fact, I think they used, I forgot which line they actually, I did it so many times, I don't remember now which line they used in the movie. When she ran out and I said something kind of like, what, what's wrong with her or something? I, I said something, because they'd said, imp don't worry about the script, improvise. So I improvised the line. And I said something really nasty, which is in the movie. And my wife, yep, that's my husband, that's him. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you for being with us, doctor. Uh, I think the People's Republic would use uh, a former abortionist. Uh, that, would, that would be really helpful to people. <laughs> I'll probably get stopped at the border to, now. But. <laughs> to, 
to get to the point though, in Canada, freedom of speech, association, and conscience is not as enshrined in our legal system as it is in your glorious constitution. Uh, I believe uh, part of reclaiming a pro-life culture is getting more pro-life doctors. Uh, what would be your top three bits of advice for pro-life med school students and doctors in Canada that want to practice their conscience but are constantly harassed by society, the media, and their peers and professional bodies? And Great question. Um, I think it's important for students to be, a po you know, to be introduced to all sides of this argument. Too often they get just one side. That's number one. Um, two, uh, I think it's important that doctors, you know, again, people look up to physicians. I know you do, and what we do is important. What we do outside of our offices and in the operating room is important. I think that it's important for physicians, Canadian as well as American, to get involved with the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetrician Gynecologists. I think Canada must have a, in the States, it's the American College of Obstetrician Gynecologists. They are so pro-abortion, it's just no end to it. Um, I, was, I was a minor officer at one point in ACOG. I was told flat out, you're out as far as an officer because you're pro-life. Um, they'll deny it now when I say it, but I wish I had a recording of that phone call. Uh, but anyway, um, but there, is, there are pro-life groups, um, and, and the one, and it, I, I believe we do have Canadian members, the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetrician Gynecologists is a professional organization that is for pro-life OBGYNs. And they, we do our own, we do a ton of work, just like ACOG does. We put out position papers and we do extensive research. It's all research-based. It's really important for people to be involved in that and have a voice and not be afraid to get up and say something. Now, that's the hard part, but it's important. And the other thing, you know, another part of APLOG, though, is also just emphasizing the fact that we want to be Hippocratic physicians. We want to practice according to the oath that we took. Now, see, they've modified the oath. Many students do not take the original Hippocratic oath anymore. But I took an oath that said that I will not do abortions. I broke the oath, but I caught up with it later. And there is a society now just getting started for physicians in both the US and Canada to practice and support them as Hippocratic physicians. I actually have two questions. How are we doing time-wise, guys? They're a bit short. <laughs> They'll, please ask your question. They'll give, I, I'll keep going. It, right. That three questions or three minutes? Three, three minutes. minutes, oh. Do we have any numbers of abortions performed on girls who are a victim of abuse, incest, minor, prostitution of minors? And the second question is, did stopping doing abortion destroy your medical career? Did you become a lawyer after that, or that was in the beginning? Or? No, I, I, that's a, I'll take number two first. Does stopping abortions destroy your career? No. Uh, we lost every friend we had. I mean, not when I stopped doing abortions. That's, everybody would have, you know, they understood what had happened with Heather and all that. But when I got into a pro-life movement, ooh, that was not good. And we, my wife and I literally lost every friend we had. That's okay. You know, we, we got pro-life friends now. No problem. <laughs> you know. And as, far as, and as far as the rape and incest thing, I did just under 1,200, in private practice, I did just under 1,200 abortions. I counted them up, 1,196. And I told you, we very carefully counseled our patients. You wanna guess, out of 1,196 abortions, how many had anything to do with rape or incest? Ready? Two. The thing with rape is, She's already in a horrible state, okay? She's been assaulted. She's been violated in the worst possible way. Um, but does abortion fix that? Or does it add to the trauma? We could argue that one all day long. And incest, that one drives me wild. Who's bringing her in for the abortion? Exactly. Who's being protected? The perp. Not the young lady, the perp. And what happens when she gets home? Same. More of the same. So, yes, it happens. And, uh, and, and they use it all the time. It's supposed to be the, the, you know, when I'm in a university, that's the killer question that's going to get me. What, let's talk about rape and incest. How about this? And I'll tell them. Tell you what. I will, I will, support, your, uh, let, I will support legislation and sign on to legislation that says we will do um, abortions only in the cases of rape and incest. Will you join me? No way. Wait a minute, I thought it was all about rape and incest. 
smoke screen. I guess my question had more to do with um, a perpetrator forcing that oh, yeah. girl, and the abortionist not asking enough questions, or the, the clinical facility not asking questions, just being, okay, another abortion, another thousand That's been demonstrated against Planned Parenthood multiple times in the United States. They're, you know, they're advising 15-year-olds on having abortions, um, even against parental consent laws. There, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. But without a government that's willing to, to do anything about it, it's difficult to do anything. I'm going to sneak in one more at least before they give me the hook. Thank you. My name is Gabriela. Uh, I, Gabriela, I just have a one question for you as a lawyer. Uh, it takes two people, man and a woman, to create a child. Oh, is that how it works? <laughs> I read that in a book. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Uh, uh, the child is not a part of, human, of a woman's body, right? It's a separate entity. Well, you got to be careful about that. It's a separate human being. In, the, in her body. But it's in her body and it's very much connected to yes, her. Yes, I understand. But it's another human being. It, she's not being uh, multiplied. Yes. All right. As a lawyer, what would you do about the situation where the father of the child has no say in this? I am very much bothered by this because I have heard stories of a man who were fighting to save the child, to have the child. But the law would not listen they to the man. won't support him. This That's is right. not fair. No kidding. But that is so, the law. Yes, it's a law. But you as a lawyer, what would you do to change this law? What can we do? How can we approach this to change the law? Because that's absolutely ridiculous. It's, the child has a mother and a father. I know. And we proclaim And you have the fathers who are perfectly father. willing to take responsibility for that child, but they're being denied. You would have to change the law so that the father has some say. But then, of course, the argument would be, but then you're forcing the woman to be pregnant. And, and, and this is the thing about forcing anybody about being pregnant. And it goes back to what we all laughed about when you said it. Most people are not being forced to get, preg to get pregnant. <laughs> The way it usually works is he takes his clothes off, she takes our, her clothes off, and it goes from there. I read about As that. As you say, too, yeah. the old fat. <laughs> yeah. In other words, another version of what you said you read about it, it's the old-fashioned way, okay? Yeah. But the law just doesn't recognize that, and it's, yeah. it's a crime. But here's yeah. the other thing, too, real quick, because I know we have to end, and I'm sorry, guys, I know you're waiting. Um, you always, it's, it's, it's not a child, it's just an embryo. It's not a child, it's just a fetus. Okay? It is, it is. Those are scientifically correct terms. Exactly. But when they're used that way, they're being used to dehumanize that individual. That's right. You know, yeah. in World War II, they weren't Germans, they were Krauts. Yeah. Or they weren't Japanese, they were Nips. Yeah. Or I was, you know, my, I'm an Italian descent, so I'm a WAP. We go on all day, yeah. right? And there's some pejoratives I can't even use. Okay, I can't even use. Yeah. Here's, to me, I, I almost never use the term embryo fetus, or even baby. I use the one term all the time when I talk about this, this is universally correct. That, you heard me do it several times, I'll remind you. That is your son or daughter. daughter. Yeah, okay. And here's the other thing about embryos and fetuses. Does your, and I do this in college campuses all the time, does your life have value? I beg your pardon. Does your life have value? Oh yes it does. Does the value of your life depend on what I think of you? Not at all. Do you, the value of your life depend on what the prime minister thinks of you? Of, of course not. <laughs> Sheesh. Does the value of your life depend on what your mother thinks of you? Of course not. Today you're an adult. Mm -hmm. Once you were a child. Once you were a baby. Once you were this big. But it was always you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Powerful is an understatement for a descriptive. Uh, we apologize to the two wonderful women who were patiently waiting there to uh, ask a question, but we are at time and we have some more things to get to tonight. But one more time, let's just give Dr. Levitino a big round of applause.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And so let's take this information, this intelligence, and let's steward it wisely in our network. So I want to, without any further delay, want to invite up the executive director of the National Campaign Life uh, Coalition right here, NCLN Network, sorry. And, you know, tonight happened, yeah. In a moment, we're going to take a short break and then begin the movie Unplanned, the screen of the movie Unplanned. But tonight happened because of the courage and leadership of this amazing woman right here. And I think we would all agree that getting this information to the campuses, getting this conversation synergizing at higher levels on the campuses is really one of the major game changers for the nation of Canada. I remember when I was um, at Simon Fraser University in my undergrad, somebody said, you know, what's happening on the campuses today will be mainstream in Canada in 10 or 15 years from today. And if that's true, then that means the work of NCLN is, is not optional if we care about this issue, if we care about truth and honesty and a compassionate and intellectually based conversation. And so Ruth is now gonna share with us about her heart and passion for this organization and how we together can band together to support NCLN to take this whole thing to the place where it needs to be in informing the next generation. Thank you, Faitine. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to visit St. FX University out in the Maritimes for the first time, training our newest campus club uh, on that campus. And uh, I was planning a leadership training for our pro-life students, and we met in a room in the library, as is normal. And so one of the first things that I do with student leaders when I meet them is I ask them their big why. Like, why are you here? Because being publicly pro-life on a university campus today is not an easy thing to do. You're putting you know, your reputation possibly on the line, your degree on the line, um, sometimes your freedom on the line if you've been arrested. Uh, you know, but hopefully that doesn't happen to all of them. Well, maybe, I don't know. Um, and so we're going around the room and I, and I ask them one at a time, you know, why are you here, why are you here? And I get to a young man named Mitchell and I say, Mitchell, why are you here? And he said, well, actually, I don't know why I'm here. I'm pro-choice. And I said, I don't know why you're here either. <laughs> uh, but now that you are, uh, why are you pro-choice? Why do you think abortion is okay? And he said, well, I think that people who are born into foster care and orphanages are a drain on the system. And I don't think we need any more people like that. And so it's better for them and their parents that these children are aborted. And so I said, okay. You know, what, you know what, Mitchell, I agree with you that the foster care system is, needs some work. I think we can agree on that. And uh, for sure, growing up in an orphanage or being in an orphanage, it's not easy. But certainly we wouldn't, you know, proceed to kill children who are living in orphanages right now as a solution to that problem. Why not? Well, we don't kill born people to solve problems like poverty. We don't go and, you know, kill the homeless and people who are struggling right now as a solution to those issues. So, you know, why would you suggest that we should kill preborn children to solve that problem? Well, I don't think they're people yet. I don't think that they have rights. I don't think that they, um, you know, we shouldn't bring more people into that cycle. And so I said to him, you know, Mitchell, who gets human rights? And he said, well, humans do. And I said, what's a human? And, and like, how do you know if someone's a human? Well, as we already discussed, you know, we know, and some people read some books on that topic. Um, we know how human, who is a human. So he agreed with me. Human beings get human rights. Um, so, you know, why, why don't these children get human rights? Well, they're not human enough. They're not human yet. They're not people. And we went around in circles. So finally, I said to him, you know, are you talking about women who, you know, maybe are living in foreign countries like India and they get pregnant and they're on the street and they might end up at an orphanage and leave the baby there and that baby may or may not be adopted and, you know, she's gone through some hardship as well. Is that the kind of situation that you're talking about? 
where you think it'd be best for her to have an abortion. And he said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Those children are drained on the system. And so I said, I wanna challenge you for a minute because that was me and my biological mom. And I was born out of a crisis pregnancy. And now you're looking at someone that you are saying is not as valuable as other people because of the situation that I came from. And what do you think now? What do you think now that you're looking at someone who came from this exact situation? And he said to me, no, I still think they're a drain. And I don't know about you, but it's not the nicest feeling in the world to be told that you're better off dead. But, you know, I, and I said that to him, and I said, you know, you need to really examine where that comes from in your life. And he had this total look of shame. And I just, you know, kind of let him sit in that. And he kind of said, you know, I don't want things to end off on a bad note. And I said, you know, Mitchell, I'm not really sure how we can do that <laughs> after a comment like that. And while that's a, you know, a difficult maybe story for you to hear, that is the, the common answer that we get on university campuses today. And we should not be surprised in Canada, in a country where we have passed down abortion generation to generation without restriction. We should not be surprised that most young people today consider the pro-abortion mentality the default position that that's their automatic answer, I think abortion is, is correct. It's not surprising, although it is devastating. And more and more on university campuses, we meet young people who, who are telling us stories about how abortion has affected their life, because how could it not? Over 100,000 abortions occur in our country every single year. That's roughly one in four women over how many years, 40, 50 years? Of course it's touched their families, like the woman that we met who said that her mom aborted her brother because she already had two boys and she didn't want another one. Or the young woman that we met who was trafficked, who had eight abortions before the age of 21. Over and over and over again, we meet young people whose lives are devastated by the reality of abortion in their families. And Dr. Levitino and Fatine touched on two things that are so key. First of all, relationship. That's why we exist. We exist to talk to young people about abortion on university campuses, develop a relationship with them, and then turn them into leaders who reject abortion and teach their, their peers to do the same. And more and more we're seeing openness from this next generation to reject abortion in our country because they're sick of being told that they're not allowed to talk about it. And young people love to talk about things you're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> so we should keep on that. Don't talk about that. Um, and secondly, because, yeah, censorship. You know, censorship has been, and that's this thing that Fatine touched on, that the things that happen on university campus right now um, you know, censorship and the entrenched censorship that we see administratively was new when I was on campus. And if you can believe it, I was on campus 10 years ago. I know I don't look like it, thank you. Um, and now it's normal. And we have a prime minister who graduated from McGill University as a social justice warrior and went and entrenched censorship at the, the federal level through the Canada Summer Jobs Program. So what happens on university campus is crucial to the trajectory of society. In any given year right now, we speak to roughly 800 young people in one year, and half of them become more fully pro-life. And a third of them are interested in going further into relationship to become leaders themselves. And so it's crucial that we maintain and create an engine for change that is going to change this country because we need to replace those leaders like the Prime Minister, if I may say so. <laughs> and, it, and it is the only way that we will see our country restored through leadership. And tonight in this room, we have a few of our leaders who are ready to rise up and who are rising up 
uh, to reach their generation on campus. And right now, I want to call them to the front. So all of our club leaders who are here tonight, who are getting trained this weekend, please come up to the front. Please welcome them. Just behind me. So this is about half of our leaders that are on campus this year, and they're here in town to meet Dr. Anthony, and then they're going to get trained this weekend and then rise up against abortion on their campuses. And like I mentioned at the beginning, this is not an easy thing to do. Many of our student leaders have encountered censorship. They've encountered discrimination. They've encountered rejection from their peers. Some of our club leaders have been assaulted. This is not an easy choice that they are making to stand between the abortion clinics and these people and their peers. And that is literally what they are choosing to do, to stand between a woman and the abortion clinic before she gets anywhere close to those doors. And as amazing as they are, and as amazing as I think my coworkers are, our work is impossible without all of you. You help us and you fuel the trajectory of our organization. Without funding, we cannot help these young people rise up against abortion. And without funding, we cannot create a tidal wave across this country of a generation that rejects abortion. So actually tonight is a kickoff of a national tour that we are headed on to visit all of our campuses across Canada, 20 campuses where we aim to reach uh, to build up another 100 leaders to rise up against abortion and reach a minimum of 1,600 people across Canada. And whether we like it or not, those endeavors do cost money. And so I'm asking you tonight if you would consider partnering with us to fund this tour and to fund our mission. The mission continues beyond tonight. And let, Dr. Anthony, I'm so grateful for you being here to educate us and to fuel our passion to rise up against this. So in your envelope that you were given, there are two forms. One form, the yellow one, is to make a one-time donation to our organization to um, help offset the cost of our tour and to fuel reaching student leaders on university campuses. Every $100 that we receive helps us speak with 15 pro-choice students on a campus a week. But the mission continues all year round. And to be honest, the greatest gift that any person in the movement can give us is a monthly donation because it stabilizes our income and allows us to focus on training these amazing people behind us and it helps us move the mission forward in a methodical fashion. Our work is impossible without people like you. And it's not, you know, just who is the pro-life movement? It's not these young people here, it's not me. It's every single person who has a pro-life conviction has a responsibility to rise up against injustice in their country. And we are the only democracy in the world that has no restriction on abortion. And just recently it was announced, you asked about RU486, that there is um, an, the ultrasound that usually women have to get to determine whether or not they're pregnant is being removed from the process of prescribing RU486 to make it easier and easier and more dangerous for women to access. The pro-choice movement is preparing for the future of abortion in this country by doing things like that. And so I ask tonight that you seal your commitment to put an end to abortion by supporting these young people and creating an abortion-free generation. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, can I, uh, Ruth, I, we need to go, through, go to a break at about the 40-minute mark, is that right? 
Okay, can I do this? I wanna put one of these students on the spot. Is there any one of you that were just up here right now that would take 60 seconds or 120 seconds just to share what it's meant to you to have the support of Ruth, Frida, the team, as you've taken a stand on your campuses? Is there one of you that would come back up? Come on, this is totally spontaneous. This is reality TV right here. I think I went to uh, the symposium last year, which is another event that NCLN uh, runs to train pro-life like students on campus. And I was really just like blown away by, I did not realize how much support that we could have if we wanted it. Because I was like, oh, the pro-life club at SFU, which is the university I'm going to is dying. Like, what can we do to get it started? And then I came to symposium. I was like, oh my gosh, like we do not have to do this on our own, right? And so we did get way, way, way more active this year. And as a result, our university is of course trying to shut us down. And that again was a huge comfort to know we do not have to do this on our own. And like NCLN is there to like navigate the legal battles if it comes to that. And just like we have so much support to know because I mean as a student if my university is fighting me and trying to shut down my club I'm like I have no idea what to do I'm gonna go like hide my head under a pillow and cry you know but like so we have like we're not all on our own and um we have people who know what they're doing which is great but um yeah and so that's kind of like my two cents oh, yeah. <laughs> wow uh, I didn't know what I was walking into tonight, I wanna to be honest. Uh, I just love Ruth, and my husband's a huge fan of Dr. Levitino, and I just believe that this is a conversation that conversation we need to be having in Canada, so that was enough for me to get on the plane, but I wanna say, I'm just being rocked right now, I don't know about you, because when I look at these young people, I don't know where each one of you are at in your phase of life, but when I look at them, I look at the mentors of my children. I have a three and a five-year-old. In the Canada that my children and that many of you, your children and your grandchildren will inherit, will be built by these voices, voices of moral clarity and sanity. And I just want to um, back up this appeal and say we need to get behind this movement. Uh, my husband and I, we are signing up to be monthly partners, but I, again, this is totally spontaneous. I want to put out a personal challenge tonight that our ministry will match uh, any, if there's another ministry in here or business or anyone that wants to sow a $5,000 donation tonight into this tour and into this movement, we will match it. And, uh, and if there's nobody here that will do that, then we'll figure out what we're going to give anyway. Okay. And uh, I know that the Bible says that when you do things publicly, you lose your reward. I'm okay with that. <laughs> if we save a few lives, <laughs> I'm not in this for reward. Uh, but the Bible also does say that where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. And I believe that we're at a moment where we need to not just pray about this, but we need to do, for those of you that are people of faith, maybe not everybody in this room is a person of faith, uh, we need to do what Jesus did. He became the word flesh, right? We need to be this message made flesh through our finances, through our voices. And by the way, Ruth kind of alluded to the fact that it's an election year. <laughs> need to make sure that we're getting behind strong candidates that are going to make this an issue in their caucuses and their parties. Um, by the way, um, Scott in the back, could you just wave your hands? If you have any questions about that, you can go and talk to him. But... Um, I don't want us to pass by this moment because I think a lot of times uh, in moments like this, we hear an inspirational message, we take some notes, we're inspired and we're stirred. But I, I want to say that we need to take action tonight uh, to get behind this movement. So please fill out that form uh, right now. Where can they hand it in? Um, okay. Yeah, so let's lock in to get behind this movement. One of my mentors, some of you might know this name, was a man named David Maines. And I'll never forget the day when we stood in front of the Parliament of Canada and he shared with me about the moment in the 80s where we lost a pro-life bill by one vote in the Senate because a senator didn't show up because he was afraid of the backlash that he would receive. And in that moment, David Maines reached over to me and he said words that shot through my soul and I've never forgotten. And he said, Fatine, the nation goes to those who show up. 
You know, Abby was changed by what she saw. And I believe as voices like this are being platformed to the next generation, we're going to begin to see something and Canada is going to begin to be changed because of what we're talking about, what we're putting on the, the movie screens, but also because we're showing up. May we never lose a vote by one, or lose a bill by one vote again. So um, here's a little bit of intensity for you before the end of the night, but thank you so much for taking time with us this evening. We are.